And my welcome to uh, that of Trev's. It's a real privilege to be able to join with you this morning as we look at this part of God's word together. Uh, Let's uh, talk to him and ask for his help as we do that. So let's pray. Our great God, thank you for the time we've been able to spend together already. Thank you for the things that you've used in our gathering to point us to yourself, to comfort us, encourage us and to challenge and stretch us. Please give us insight now into yourself, into ourselves as well as we reflect together on your word. Amen. Well, the uh, characteristic of stubbornness, uh, being known for being stubborn, isn't usually something that's seen in a particularly positive light. It's usually seen as something that's negative. People don't usually like getting the kind of reputation of being stubborn. Uh, It's sometimes associated with the way our wives think of their husbands, uh, perhaps rolling their eyes and uh, putting their hands up in despair. Um, Maybe it's to do with an unwillingness to go and see a doctor uh, when you should. Uh, or putting off certain jobs, or perhaps it's something that happens when you're in the car. Uh, there's been more than one occasion when I've been driving and I've put the instructions into my phone and that, that's let me you know, know where I'm supposed to be going, only for me to insist, well, uh, what's that thing know anyway? I know where I'm going, I know how to get there, and with the inevitable result, of course, of going somewhere where you shouldn't. So there's a, certainly a negative side to stubbornness, uh, but I think there can be a good side to it as well, a positive. I remember a few years back talking to uh, one of the teachers at Caleb's school and uh, she was talking about one of the girls that she had in her class who was in, I don't know, kindergarten or year one or something like that, and the teacher was saying uh, how the girl was quite headstrong uh, and very insistent on things and obviously causing some class management issues for, uh, for her as the teacher. In talking about this issue with someone else, however, the teacher told me that she'd been helped to see the good in that particular situation. That down the track and in time, this girl may well grow up to be a woman who knows clearly what she thinks and is able to stand up for herself, which is actually a good, a positive thing. Think also of someone like William Wilberforce. Uh, Some might say that he was stubborn in his position on slavery. How many years was it, decades even, uh, that he stuck to the task of seeking the abolition of slavery and and how do we view him? Or Nelson Mandela, uh, 27 years in prison, uh, sticking to his convictions that the colour of a person's skin should not prevent them from being able to vote and being full citizens and enjoying freedom in their country of South Africa. And what do we think of that stubbornness, if you like, now? Being stubborn can be negative, of course, but it can also be good. There can also be even a splendour associated with a certain kind of stubbornness. I'm hesitant this morning to say that God is stubborn because of the negative connotations that come with that word, that characteristic. But I want to at least say that what we'll see in our passage for today is that our God is a God who is determined. He's determined. Determined to make good on his promises and determined to rescue his people and make them his own. And as we work through our passage this morning, it's a big passage. It goes from Exodus 4.18 through to Exodus 7.7. As we work our way through, what we're going to see is we're going to see God's determination against the backdrop of various human obstacles. Pharaoh's feistiness, Israel's fickleness, and Moses' failures. So the first of these human obstacles we're going to look at and consider is Pharaoh's feistiness. He, of course, would object to the uh, description of him being a human obstacle because he spent his whole life thinking of himself as a god. And that's a big part of the problem. In response to Moses and Aaron saying to him, chapter 5, verse 1, 
This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Pharaoh responds, chapter 5, verse 2. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. This is the moment we've been waiting for, chapters 4, and, and actually 80 years. It's God versus Pharaoh. And this contest, it's going to last for the next 10 chapters or so and the next few talks in our Exodus series. Pharaoh's words here are less a statement of ignorance and more a statement of defiance. He is the ruler and there is no room for any other in his view of the world. He sees himself in the place of God and insists that God bow to his will rather than the other way round. A number of years ago when we were living in Canberra, the youth of our particular church at the time went into the shopping area in Civic in the main sort of city centre and they went around and asked people what they thought of God. And they videoed the responses and they put together um, that into a little package and they showed it one night at church. And I I remember one response from a very well-dressed and well-spoken man and he said, well, you know, I've made a bit of a deal with God. He can run heaven and I'm going to run earth. I wonder if you hear yourself in those words. Or do you remember when you thought like that or, or lived like that? That I'm the one in charge, I call the shots, I'll live life the way I see fit and everyone else, God included, can revolve around me. It's what the Bible sees as being at the heart of sin. But all of us inevitably end up encountering the one true and living God. And if we persist in thinking that we're God, then like Pharaoh and the Egyptians, we will encounter him as the God who is against us. And we'll be seeing that in the weeks to come. We're probably not overly surprised by the fact that Pharaoh is one of the human obstacles in the story. What we might be more surprised by and and even disappointed by is to see that God's own people, Israel, proved to be an obstacle as well. Israel's fickleness is the second human obstacle we observe in these chapters. Everything looks so good and so positive at the beginning. Uh, Moses and Aaron come, end of chapter 4, and they communicate what the Lord had said and they perform the signs. And chapter 4, verse 31, the people, they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. See, what a start. It it seems like an exemplary response, doesn't it? There's faith and there's worship. But it doesn't take long for everything to start unravelling. Moses and Aaron's words to Pharaoh only served to make the situation of the Israelite slaves even worse. They're now forced to make the same number of bricks, but they're required to go and get the straw as well. How do they respond? Well, have a look at chapter 5, verse 15. 515, then the Israelite foreman went and appealed to Pharaoh. Why have you treated your servants this way? See, that word appealed, it's the same word that we saw at the end of chapter 2 when the Israelites cried out to God. So what's happening here is that instead of turning to their God, they're actually turning away from him and looking to someone else. They're looking to Pharaoh. Not only that, but the same event, being forced to complete the same amount of bricks, but not being given any straw to make those bricks, it causes these Israelite foremen to turn on God's representatives, Moses and Aaron. So see a few verses down in verse 20 of chapter 5. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them, and they said, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. 
You've made us stink, Moses and Aaron. Their hardship even ends up affecting their ability and their willingness to receive and to accept the words of their God. See, after a wonderful section of assurances from God at the beginning of chapter 6, that passage that Trevor read out for us and that we'll look at in a moment, in chapter 6, verse 9, we read, Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and cruel bondage. This is the very time that they need to take God at his word when they need to receive and and believe his word, and yet they're not prepared to because they're so dominated by and so consumed by their current circumstances. Chapter 6, verse 9 is a far, far cry, isn't it, from what we saw of the faith and the worship at the end of chapter 4. There's been a real fickleness to Israel's response to the response of God's people, and it prevents presents another obstacle. What's happened with God's people? Well, can't you relate to this yourself? Can't you see yourself in this scene somewhere? Or at least feel the tug, the the pull of what's going on here? If we don't understand the way in which God uses hardships and trials in the lives of his people, that it's God's arena to grow and to change and to stretch us, we too can get pulled away from him and start turning to other things for our comfort and our help and our joy. At the very time when we most need to take God at his word, we can find ourselves not listening to him because of what we're going through not receiving, not accepting his word to us because of the life circumstances that we might find ourselves in. The third human obstacle is actually Moses himself and his failures. You see, if you spend time looking at what the Bible actually says here rather than following along with the movies based on the events of Exodus, you'll soon see that Moses isn't the hero of this story at all. There's only one true hero here. I want us to see that by comparing what God says to Pharaoh about what he's to do and what Moses actually does. Back in chapter 3, verse 18 from last week, God told Moses that he's to take the elders with him when he goes to Pharaoh. Keep that in mind. Look also at what God says in chapter 4, verse 22. 4.22, God says to Moses, then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go, so that he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Now have a look at what actually happens. Chapter 5, verse 1, it's Moses and Aaron going to Pharaoh. Where are the elders that God had said that he was to bring along with him? And have a look at what's actually said. Chapter 5, verse 1 again. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. If you compare what God had said to say in chapter 4 with what Moses actually says here in chapter 5, there are all kinds of differences. Moses adds the God of Israel. He removes the reference to firstborn son. Let my son go becomes let my people go. The purpose, so he may worship me, becomes so that they may hold a festival to me. And there's no mention of the threat to Pharaoh's firstborn son. So Moses, he subtracts from what he's supposed to say and he adds what isn't there. 
which if you know anything about being a spokesman for God, is a pretty big deal. Add to that the really strange incident in chapter 4, verses 24 to 26, which I'm not going to spend much time on, and there's a lot there that I just don't understand. But what does seem clear enough in that little episode is that Moses hasn't even carried out one of the basic Old Testament elements of being in relationship with God, circumcision. Moses even channels a bit of Adam in the garden here in our section. So have a look at the end of chapter 5. After his first words to Pharaoh end up making the situation for God's people even worse, chapter 5, verse 22, as Trevor read out before, Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble upon these people and you have not rescued your people at all. Sounds like Adam in the garden, doesn't it? The woman you put here with me? And the excuses that we saw right throughout chapters 3 and 4, they just continue. Chapter 6, verse 10 6.10, then the Lord said to Moses, go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, if the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me, since I speak with faltering lips? And we get it again at the end of chapter 6 as well. Chapter 6, verse 30. But Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh Listen to me. Sounds a bit like beat up on Moses, doesn't it? But aren't you only too aware of your failures as well? Not saying something that you know you should. Saying things that you shouldn't. Not being completely obedient to the life that God has called you to being quick to accuse God when things turn out differently, where they get worse for us rather than better, having all kinds of excuses for why we have or haven't done something. You see, if God's going to do what he's promised to do, if, he, if he's going to rescue his people and make them his own, He's going to have to overcome Pharaoh's feistiness, Israel's fickleness and Moses' failures. He is going to have to be the one to do it, isn't he? And that's the exact assurance that God brings his people in this wonderful word in chapter 6. He's determined. That's what we have on view for us here, God's determination. Firstly, he's determined to make good on his promises. Have a look there at chapter 6, verse 2. Chapter 6, verse 2. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they lived as aliens. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob did know God as the Lord, of course. You can read that through the book of Genesis. But it's in the events of the Exodus that God is going to more fully reveal himself to his people as the Lord. He's going to give a new level of meaning to his name. The covenant, the agreement, the promises that he made to those forefathers of the faith, he is now going to make good on. That's what it means when it says that he remembers. It's not as though God forgets. It's that he's now going to act on those promises in a way that will make clear that he's making good on those promises. He is determined to do that, determined to make good on what he has promised. 
We also see here that God is determined to rescue his people and make them his own. See from verse 6. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. What is God's word to his people? I will. I will. I will. I will. Six or seven times in just two or three verses. See, God is determined. He will do this. He will make sure they are freed from their slavery. He will redeem them and make them his own. He will bring them to the place that he has promised. You see, Pharaoh's feistiness is no problem for God. Israel's fickleness can't prevent this. Not even Moses' failures can sabotage what God is up to. He is determined to make good on his promises. He is determined to rescue his people and make them his own. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, come hell or high water. If you say that you'll do something, come hell or high water, it means that you're absolutely determined to do it, despite any difficulties, any obstacles or barriers that there might be. See, isn't that our God? (laughs) So determined is he that we not face the horrors of hell itself, that he sends his own son, who with outstretched arms on the cross frees us from our slavery to sin and death, rescues and redeems us and makes us his own people, secures a place for us with him forever. See, when we feel like life hasn't worked out the way we'd hoped, when instead of it getting better, it just seems to have become harder, when the dreams that we might have had seem destined to remain just that, dreams, when his timing doesn't seem to bear any resemblance to our own, when you feel that God has let you down, or when you feel like you just keep letting him down, when you feel the weakness of your faith and doubts creep in, when your worship of him doesn't seem so genuine, when you feel the urge to look elsewhere for your comfort and your help and your joy, when your struggles seem so overwhelming that you find it hard to listen to and accept his word, when your words haven't been what you'd hoped them to be or what you know they should be again. When you feel more sinner than saint and your obedience has been swept away by your sin, may we remember our God who is determined, determined to make good on his promises determined to rescue his people and make them his own, come hell or high water. Feistiness, fickleness, failure are no match for this God who says, I will, I will, I will. We're going to sing again. Well, we're not going to sing, but we'll sing in our hearts. And as we do that, hopefully these words will resonate with the feelings and the the emotions of your hearts as we reflect on what we've just heard from God's word. So I invite you to stand as the music plays, reflect on the words and meditate on them in your hearts.